and it hits me, oh my gosh, this is that triangle. You know, there's explanation for everything that occurred in the Rendlesham Forest incident that doesn't involve aliens at all. It was completely silent. It comes right over our heads. He saw a classic flying saucer really standing in the clearing. He turned over to my father and held his hand and he looked in his eyes and he said, we're not alone. All right, and welcome to the show. This is Martin Willis, your host, and I am actually in Russia. I know you people are probably tired of hearing that, and it'll be another couple of weeks that I'm here. But uh, the good thing is, is I get to talk to people like our guest today, Klaus Swan, who is in Sweden, and it's not the middle of the night like it usually is when I do my shows back in uh, the U.S. So it's great. It's uh, it's one o'clock in uh, Eastern Standard Time. It's 8 o'clock here in Moscow and 7 o'clock in Stockholm where he is. And in California, I don't know what time. What time is it in California, Alejandro? It is 10 a.m. 10 a.m. I have this world world clock thing. I have to look all all the time or I'm, you know, going to wake people up in the middle of the night. Yeah. So just a couple. You're a man of international mystery. (laughs) Just now. All right. So Mm -hmm. uh, I do want to thank our supporters. And if you'd like to support the show for $2 or more a month, you can find that information on uh, podcastufo.com. You can also watch us live uh, Wednesdays for a couple more weeks, 1 to 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And uh, also on YouTube, we are YouTube live streaming. And uh, Alejandro and I, we we don't have video today, neither one of us. I, I can't get it to work on my computer for some reason. And uh, so I just thought best uh, not being uh, trying to make uh, the news here on video, but uh, but uh, Klaus Svan will be joining us later, and he will be on video. So, Alejandro, how's it going out there? It is going very well. Um, it's sunny and beautiful, um, and yeah, good stuff. Yeah, yeah, I am. Uh, I always enjoy California. It's such a wonderful place, yeah. especially where you go. It yeah. always seems like it's nice weather yeah. there, almost all the uh, time. Yeah, well. Yeah, but to get to go to the good places. But uh, yeah, and and just so people don't freak out, I'm I'm still updating all of uh, our stuff, so uh, you can still, you know, uh, go to our site and get news. We posted news today. We've got a UFO story we posted yesterday. We'll have one that we'll be posting today. So still keeping busy remotely wherever I am. So. No worries to those who are need their, their UFO news fix. That's right, yeah. And you do this, uh, I really like the thing you do, is the uh, UFO headlines. So you scour the yeah. news and come up with that every single, not well, not every day, but almost every day, right? Yeah, pretty much every weekday. And, and I think what's what's interesting is that there's, there's something out there pretty much every day. It's rare that I have a day I can't find something and even uh last week there were a couple days where i found like too much you know there was a ton of stuff so yeah there's always something interesting going on uh that somebody in the mainstream media is writing about uh somewhere and you know a lot of times these are local papers but uh, sometimes it's not so for instance there's a story in vibe there's a story in the washington post and uh this is kind of interesting nt news um, which is uh, Northern Territory, Australia. They've been really writing quite a bit about UFOs over the last couple of years, and so they have another story out of what they say are their favorite UFO video clips, uh, and so we have that in our headlines today. All right. Are there some good clips? What do you think? Uh, you know what? I haven't looked them over that much. It looks like a lot of the clips are uh, hoax hoax videos that we've already talked about before, Uh-oh. Um, mm. but uh, not all of them. Yeah. Well, you know, that's the thing. There is some amazing UFO clips that are very well done. I'll put it that way. <laughs> that yeah, I've seen no kidding. Know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Especially the one that had like 15 million views or something and that CGI in Haiti or someplace like that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that Crazy. one is pretty much the most viewed um, right. of mm-hmm. all. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that, that's a pretty interesting one. Uh, the other one that the NT has here is uh, uh, the Chile one. And, of course, that's been a bit controversial. And you had Leslie Kane on to – we both did uh, yeah. and to speak about that one. Although I had her on right when the vi- the story had broke right. and the video got out. 
And then you had her on a couple of days later, and by that time, there were a lot of people who felt that they had figured out what that video was, that it was in an actual aircraft. So, um, yeah, well, I, yeah I, that was kind of cool that it worked out that way, that we both got to, you know, have right. them on at the different times. And I think I, if my memory serves me right, I think I suggested to Leslie that we cancel that show. Mm-hmm. Um, because it was it was it was kind of uh, figured out by that time that it was uh it oh I thought that. oh so you canceled it I thought you yeah. had it I'm pretty sure we canceled oh. yeah oh. save save face a little bit yeah oh yeah she yeah. did write an article though so and uh, she did, I know right. we had yeah. written a, a bit about that and at least we had talked about it I, I remember yeah yes yeah so what else is happening. Yeah, so other news out there. So uh, there's an interesting video. You and I have talked about this uh, a little bit. It was a story we did. <laughs> I'm giggling because originally I had, um, um, you know, had a typo in the title and I had the shinning disc, but uh, a reader had pointed that out. But it was a shining disc. So UFO witness captures a shining disc on video near Toronto Harbor front. Um, the first thing that you notice about this video is that the Toronto Harbor front is beautiful. What It looks like a super cool place. Um, just to, And they've got this like spike, this big tower there. And this tower is actually prominent in this video as well. Um, but this couple was out uh, at the harbor front for Canada Day, which is July 2nd. Now, why is Canada Day two days before July 4th? Are they trying to steal our thunder? That's another question. I don't have any <laughs> answers regarding that, but it does make me curious. Uh, however, these guys were out there for the festivities, and it was during the day, and they took a video, and I think you've watched this, and you think it's interesting, too, where it's this round object with, like, a, a dark center. It almost looks like a white uh, record, like album, mm -hmm. that uh, if, if you're younger and you've never heard of a record album and you're like, what the, what the heck are you talking about? Um, look it up. There used to be these flat plastic discs that we played music off of. Um, and that's what it looks like. It's like a, this white disc. Uh, and it it disappears and reappears, uh, making it seem as though perhaps it's tumbling or spinning so that when it you know we see the edge, we don't see it. And then once it comes around and reflects in the sun and, and the full face is facing us, then we do see it. Some people have argued that's not what it looks like, that perhaps it is a round object with something dark in the middle. And uh, many, you know, Mylar balloons are like that. They're, they're silver and they have, you know, a cartoon character or something or a teddy bear or whatever uh, in the middle. We see these at the grocery store all the time. However, the fading in and out, uh, I don't think is explained by, you know, just a balloon um, kind of turning uh, it could be possible that the clouds are blocking the sun and it's going in and out of shadow, but you'll see in the video there is not much sun there. So I think this is a really interesting video, more interesting video than we've seen in a while. And uh, I know you saw this. And, yes. and what did you think? Yes, I think it's, uh, I don't think it can be explained at all as a balloon just because it's so perfectly round and it seems like it's on a. Um, to, to direct, you know, to direct you to re boy, I'm having a hard time with that word today. Trajectory. It seems like it's on a path. <laughs> yeah. and, um, There's words I have problems with. Yep. Yeah. Um, and it's, it, it gets very, very bright. Now I understand reflection could do that if it hits the sun. And then, like you said, if there could have been uh, a cloud that would be blocking the sun, although you don't see any clouds in the sky, or I couldn't see any. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's very bright. It's moving. Um, it's very interesting. It just completely disappears. It comes back into vision. Um, so I'm going to tell the uh, listener, check that out on openminds.tv, uh, that video, um, and see what you think. I think it's really fascinating. I think it's a good uh, a video that needs to be looked at hard. That's what I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I think it's really interesting. So uh, if, you know, if MUFON does post about it later on, we'll definitely update people. Um, and I hope they do because uh, it's an interesting video. And this is a MUFON case. I don't know if I mentioned that. So it was something that was submitted to them. So uh, yeah. originally in the story, I had only the video that uh, was posted 
on the MUFON site, so I linked to that, and you can still see that link. That's the raw video uploaded by the witness. But uh, then you or or somebody uh, you had notified me that uh, the it apparently the witness um, posted the video on YouTube yes. as well. So mm -hmm. I did embed that for people to see, um, and it, and you know even the reaction from the person. It's something that's helpful to analyze is how they post it what they're saying in the video, those sort of things. And it all seems genuine that this is uh, just, you know, it's a normal couple who um, who witnessed something they can't explain. I think so. And I do have to correct you slightly about one thing. Uh -oh. I think people know what records are. As a matter of fact, there is a resurgence. Really? Yeah, there's a resurgence of vinyl. It's coming mm. back. Haven't you heard that? Really? Heard that? Yes. Uh, people ridiculous. are buying turntables again and buying records. Now... If I'm wrong, uh, email me. But I think uh, I'm pretty sure that's what I've been hearing. I have a friend that sells well, there, vintage, and he was telling me there's a big comeback in vinyl. That's kind of silly, I think. <laughs> Just get their fun. Hey, when I was a little kid, I had this one, and uh, it was like, you know, a little kid one where they're all big and bulky, and I had these little records that you could put on there and listen to, like about dinosaurs, and it was a lot of fun. <laughs> but it's ancient technology, man. You can use... Uh, your phone and everything, and what's cool, you know, even the the wiki 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 rapper studio things are all digital, so you can make that sound digital, and you don't have to worry about these huge discs that you carry around that break and melt. Yeah. And so, yeah, I don't know, but uh, that's good to know. At least uh, they're learning a bit about history. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, two more mentions before okay. we leave. I just want to sure. say, in the headlines, there's a couple interesting stories that have been out there uh, in the last couple, uh, last few days. One, I think this is cool. So Goop, which is a website that is owned by Gwyneth Paltrow, had an interview of uh, with Leslie Kane, who we mentioned earlier. And so that's kind of neat. And it's about UFOs, because, of course, she's written about life after death recently in her latest book. But uh, it is about UFOs. So that's pretty cool. Um, that's mm -hmm. something to look out for. And the other thing is, this is kind of interesting for any fans of Prodigy. Um, he's a musician uh, or, or passed away recently. But uh, I guess he had a UFO sighting. So there's a story about him having a UFO sighting and thinking maybe even he could call them in. But uh, that is a story that was on Vibe today. So that's something to look at, too, that's kind of interesting. So... Mm. Of course, you can find these uh, right on the front page in the Daily UFO Headlines, uh, the one from today. Uh, but if you go into the article and go to Daily UFO Headlines, you'll see some of the previous ones, and you'll be able to find uh, the link. I think that was Monday. It was the 7th um, to Goop, Gwyneth Paltrow's website. So that's kind of cool, I think. That is great. Yeah, that's awesome. And I, mm -hmm. I like the fact when, um, you know, you and I have had these conversations when before when, you know, celebrity gets involved at, and people take it serious, I should say, uh, more people will look at it, you know, what's going on. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a good thing. I agree. I agree 100%. Um, I think it's a good thing. The, the uh, you know, they all have followers. And some people, I think because they don't like the celebrity, get really upset. Who cares what they think? But, you know, celebrities have mostly largely like one is paltrow millions of followers and people right. who are following her site so it's introducing the topic and especially with an interview from leslie kane in a credible way to people who otherwise would have no exposure to this stuff so definitely i agree a very positive thing and i i always feel great about um you know celebrities getting involved i i don't personally feel that's a negative thing some people feel there's credibility issues, but we cause our own credibility issues, no doubt, um, enough. So, uh, I, I, yeah, I agree with you. All right. Hey, well, you have yourself a great time out there. All right. Thanks. You too. Get some time on and, the uh, beach. And have a great interview. All right. Yeah. All right. Oh, thanks, yeah, Alejandro. No, I'll be out there within the, within the, the hour. <laughs> I'm sure you will. All right. <laughs> Take care now. Talk to you later. All Bye. right. All right, Klaus, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Hi, welcome to the show. <laughs> Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thanks so much for being here. Let me just uh, switch, whip something out here real quickly. Um, all right. So, how are you, Klaus? Uh, welcome to the show. You've been on um, 
a, a number of times. I uh, always enjoy hearing from you a lot. And uh, can you give the listener who hasn't heard you before your background? Now, you started um, you started very young in this field. So why don't, why don't you talk about that and uh, what got you interested in the very first uh, first place? You know, we were young once upon a time, all <laughs> of us. And <laughs> I was uh, 15 of age when I started a small society in a small city in the south of Sweden where I was born. A uh, city called Mariestad, and we were only 10 or 12 boys, not a single girl in sight. That, uh, well, we, we, we decided that we wanted to know some more about UFOs, not just read about them. We wanted to go out in the field to uh, make interviews, to try to find explanations, to make uh, documentation. And since then, since that day, May 18th, 1974, I've done so every day of my life, really. A couple of hours every day. So, yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> really. It's uh, like Christmas Eve, maybe. But uh, most of the other days, I do something that really has to do with UFOs and to find an answer, a solution to this uh, enigma. Uh-huh. So, I've been involved in UFO Sweden, which is the, uh, the organization here in Sweden. I've been um, a chairman for many, many years. Now, I'm, uh, I'm uh, second in command because I wanted some new, younger, uh, to come in and take over after me, mm-hmm. but I'm still very involved in you for Sweden, and I also work very much with the archives for the unexplained, which we will come back to later, I presume. Now, if you're yes, absolutely. If you're watching live on YouTube or later on YouTube after it's uh, been archived, you will see in the background these are uh, books that are just. This is your home office, right? That you're in now. Yeah. Uh, but your uh, but the archives are up to. I asked you earlier before we went live. 32,000 books, which is just that's amazing. Only, that's, only, that's only the books, really, but we have 500 square meters of, uh, of area and uh, hundreds of thousands of magazines, hundreds of thousands of newspaper clippings. We have audios, we have uh, videos, we have uh, paraphernalia. We have all kind of stuff that you can really imagine that goes with the label UFO or you can say everything in the, into the paranormal so um, we collect and we uh, make things available. That's what we do. Do you have a lot of publishers that come out with a new book? I get a lot of new books in the mail um, all the time, which is really one of the benefits of having a show. Do you have that happen as well? People send you books when they publish them? Yeah, they do. And, uh, but we also try to make contact with authors uh, so we are um, on top of them before they are writing, of course. And we travel a lot. I just came back from uh, Holland and Belgium. I brought back 500 books and a couple of thousands of magazines. I will go to Britain in, in October to bring back 100 at least boxes ah. with with UFO stuff. And uh, so that uh, I do that every year. And uh, we went to California uh, last year and wow. saved the fantastic archives in Eureka in California. Oh, yeah. I know where that is. Uh, would you say... Uh, what would you say is your most prized book in the uh, in the archives? Do you have the Holy Grail? <laughs> we, we have a couple of books from the uh, 1700s about um, uh, visions, uh, which are very, very expensive. Ah. We took a um, couple of thousand dollars uh, for, for each of the books, and uh, mm-hmm. there are quite a few books in that range, really. But most of them are in the paranormal field, because UFOs, well... They just started to, to come around in the 1940s, and uh, they are not that expensive. But you can find books that we <clears throat> must pay eight, seven or eight hundred dollars for if we want to buy them. Mm-hmm. So there are are fine things out there that we we have most of it now, but we're still looking for for some gems. Really, we are. Yep. Now um, I've talked to a couple of antique book dealers that just deal in libraries of books and I've always asked them to contact me if they find anything in UFOs mm-hmm. and I've talked to about three or four of them and I haven't had one single call yet <laughs> so no, it, I'm sure it'll like happen that. but you know it's hard to find them because um, there are not too many of them I, I, I met a lady in Holland just uh, last week she got a library like mine eight or nine thousand books and some are very very rare very nice things but mm-hmm. Mostly in Dutch, but some of them in English as well. Very nice. Now, who funds the uh, keeping of these books? 
is it self like a self-funded organization? Or we are around fifty people that uh, putting money from our own pockets into this. Wow. Um, so we are really doing this for ourselves, but for the greater benefit of others. We started in 1973 with, with AFU, and uh, since then we have paid for most of it ourselves. The last couple of years we had, uh, had some help from the Swedish Unemployment Agency uh, that put people with us uh, to work, and we do get some money for doing that. Oh, that's nice. But, uh, yeah, that's good, very good, because it, uh, the, the government really is helping us in that way. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> the government helping when it comes to UFOs. Um, do you have, uh, is there, is there uh, a need for funding of any kind to help help this? And, and, and tell, tell us about that. Yeah, I mean, it really is. This is uh, historical. This is a value for all mankind, I should say. What we are doing, nobody else is doing. Mm -hmm. So uh, the money coming in, from outside our own pockets are very limited. Yeah. We are always on the edge every month. It, it turns around, but mm -hmm. nothing more. We cannot save much. So uh, if anyone is interested, go to afu.se and take a look. And please, there are there are a bottom donate. You could help us very, very much with that. Yeah, yeah. Now, I know someone who took a large, not not a library like yours, but a library of antique books, about 5,000 of them, and he digitize them yeah now, that's good um, now has there ever been any talk about possibly I know that would be a vast undertaking but has there ever been any talk about digitizing so that everybody can see what you have uh, absolutely we are digitizing every day but mostly uh, UFO magazines uh -huh. and uh, news, newspaper clippings uh, we have digitized around a couple of hundreds of thousands newspaper clippings wow and uh, and maybe 150 magazines. So we are doing that all the time. The books is another topic, really, because you have to have a book scanner. Yes. And the books are very expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, we have saved money for buying one of those, but uh, uh, we have not really decided to buy it yet. But that will be the next step for us. Wow. So can anybody in the world go to this website and actually see those clippings that you already have digitized? Uh, not yet. You can go there, you can see uh, a lot of things, but we are going to publish uh, most of the things we have on our website, probably behind some very, very cheap but uh, annual donation uh, button or something like that. Mm -hmm. Then you can get access to the material we have. That is our goal. You can w visit us, which many people do from all around the world, to sit down and make copies and read. But we will be out on the internet with uh, much more in, in, say, a year or so. Wow. Okay. Now, um, so this is all very interesting, but everybody loves talking about UFOs, so we're going to sk skip along to that. <laughs> but I think uh, it's wonderful that you have this available, and uh, the future can only be better as far as the digitizing of it. So um, you and I have talked about uh, ghost rockets in the past this was back in i think it was 1946 wasn't it when the right. and um we do have a couple of questions that came in uh in regards to that but um can you tell say there's someone listening that has never heard anything about ghost rockets can you talk about them as you said it was uh, in 1946 it all started but uh, you can still see them uh, from time to time. But 1946 was a very special year. It was the year after the Second World War ended, and uh, everyone knew about uh, the V-1 and the V-2 bombs that, uh, that Hitler and Nazi Germany had created. And suddenly, in the beginning of 1946, strange objects, looking very, very much like the V bombs, started to fly over Sweden, Norway, and Finland. Mm. And, which was very strange, Sometimes they crashed. They crashed into lakes, never on ground. <clears throat> they crashed into lakes many, many times. And people saw them around the lakes. They heard a splash. They, they saw them in broad daylight. And the military sent uh, their investigation teams to the lakes. They combed them for weeks and weeks, never found anything except an indentation or something at the bottom of the lake. And they can see that... Uh, Stones were, were thrown up on the shore, and I could see that something had impacted there. But 
they, they put a very, very great effort into finding the solution of, of the ghost rockets. More than 1,000 observations were processed by the military in 1946. But they never found a solution. And up until today, it's still, they're still coming. You can still see them from time to time. And they are still crashing into lakes, which is very strange. That is so, that's always fascinated me from the very first time I heard about this. Have you ever spoken to an actual eyewitness of one? Uh, maybe 100 or something like that. I, I met. <laughs> really? <laughs> <Whoa>. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> that, that must be. Uh, yeah, go ahead. I mean, I spent a lot of time trying to, to pin down the original observers. And I started with this in the early 1980s. Uh, and they were still alive, of course, many of them. Now, most of them are gone. Mm-hmm. But uh, the most interesting story, really, happened in 1948, two years after, when a man was sitting at the shore of, of a small lake south of Stockholm. In the middle of the day, he heard and he saw a huge rocket-like thing come flying from the south, navigating, diving into the water with a great water column, 20 meters high, splashing up in the air. He was not an ordinary witness. He was the, the, the military, the highest military in Sweden, the commander-in-chief of the military. Wow. So when he saw that, he started a process. I mean, he started radar surveillance all around Sweden. He started an investigation into the lake. And I read his diary. You can see there that he was very, very puzzled. And uh, they were combing the lake. But it was a huge layer of mud. And they decided it must have sunk down in the mud somewhere. They never found it. But the last entry in his diary says, something found in the lake. Divers will come tomorrow. And then nothing. And we don't know what happened after that. (laughs) Oh, my God. Wow. Hey, did anyone of the witnesses that you talked to talk about any sound that these things made? They, they could hear the sound from them. They were like airplanes uh, sometimes. They were also chased by one, one Swedish fighter pilot at one time, but he was outflown of this uh, ghost rocket. So they could hear sound, and they could see the sun uh, reflecting in the hull. They could see that there were no wings, no cockpit, sometimes small wings, but never a cockpit. They were never seen any creatures together with those. But there are observations later on with creatures as well, but not in 1946. Wow, I do want to talk about that before we move out of this subject. But one of the questions in the forum is, um, is there anything new to report about locating what crashed or landed in Lake Nama Jari? I can't pronounce that correctly. Um, (laughs) But uh, is that what you were just talking about, that particular... No, no, that's another one. Uh, Lake Namajaure is in the very north of Sweden. And uh, we went there in uh, 2012 and 2014 uh, trying to locate this object. Because in 1980, two uh, people from Stockholm were were hiking up in this area. And suddenly at 11 o'clock in the middle of the day, great day, in the middle of summer, they heard a sound from something flying in the air, coming from the south, flying over them. And they can see an elongated shape with uh, small wings, maybe, less than 100 meters above them. Wow. Go out over the lake, turned around 180 degrees, flew back towards them, and they were very scared. It was the middle of the Cold War, and they thought this was something Russian, mm. and they thought something will hit us. Mm-hmm. But it didn't. It landed on the on the on the lake with a splash like that, and they could see it was sinking and the bubbles coming up from it. And that object we are trying to locate because this was reported to the military at the time, and they couldn't find it. Uh, mm-hmm. So we went back with the witnesses, and they pointed where it was, and we made a sonar map of all of the lake. But as I told you, in 1948. The commander-in-chief, it was mud, four meters of mud. Mm. So we had to go back again in in, uh, 2014 with another equipment that could see through the mud. Mm -hmm. And uh, suddenly we got some very interesting uh, radar returns. And now we're going back again to try to 
take a real good look at the radar regions. It should be in this winter. We go on ice with small on snowmobiles, trying to see through the ice and looking down on these exact spots where those returns were, were coming from. Wow. Now, um, how deep is the lake at that point? It's very shallow. It's ah. only four meters. Wow, 12 four. feet. Wow, something yeah. like 12 feet. Yeah. It's nothing, really. It's, uh, it's not a problem in that respect at all. But in the middle of nowhere, and, and, okay. and you cannot uh, go there easily because you have the permits and uh, you, you, are not, you cannot fly there if you don't have permits. It takes a lot of time to get those. We, we have those permits. We can do this. Mm-hmm. But what we can do, we cannot bring anything out of this park. It's a natural park. Hmm. So everything that's in there must stay there. So if we find this stuff, someone else, maybe the military or the government in some respect, must help us. The government must what? They help us to bring oh, help this, you. Uh, yes. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, that would be nice if they would. Uh, because it would cost an awful lot of money to get something up from the bottom. Um, yeah, wow. Um, so what would you consider, I mean, the the case you talked about where this thing, or this one, I guess, where it flew back and forth and everything, um, yeah. is just fascinating. What are some of the hypotheses that people are coming up with what these things uh, might be if they weren't, you know, uh, from another planet? What If they were... Man-made, what on earth would they be? It's really a good question. Yeah. I mean, I've been, I've been on top of this since 1980, in early 1980s, and I, I have no idea what they could be uh, coming from or made of, because the observations are very, very good. There are hundreds and hundreds of observers. Sometimes there are even 100 people around one lake wow. seeing this crashing down. But nothing is found. I mean, there was a V-bomb in 1944 that crashed in the south of Sweden. There was 2,200 kilos, 2.2 tons mm-hmm. of debris after that one. And here, nothing. Nothing at all. I don't know. This is an uh, enigma to me. This is the, one of the greatest UFO puzzles I can think of, really. This is something that really is hardware, but you, you cannot find a trace of it. Yeah. That um, that that is something that makes me think of when something disappears. I always think of the possibility of interdimensional. But that you know, every time I say that, people think I'm stretching it a little too far, and I I have no idea. But you know, it just makes you wonder when there are no answers for something plain disappearing. You know what yeah. the heck it could be, and why yeah. would it go into a lake? <laughs> yeah, lake I mean, after lake. They- they were looking for lakes. I mean, you can see that they they really wanted to go into lakes because they wanted to to hide probably yeah. in the lakes. But why? And yeah. how could they do that? Any, I mean, uh, yeah, it's it's not an easy thing to to understand. 1946, the Swedish military speculated that they were TV monitored and atomic energy monitored. There were also they were very, very high-tech things. TV, atomic engine, nuclear-powered. That was the thoughts they had in 1946. 1946, wow, they came up with that. Um, and has any of them ever crashed into the ocean? Is there a coastal, um, anywhere near any coastal areas where they've crashed? No, no, no never. Only on land lakes, <laughs> yeah. not in water outside, no. And how about um, any that ever been reported that um, people thought may have landed on the ground? There are no such reports at all. Uh, people have, have seen them vanishing behind the forest and thought maybe they were hitting the ground. But there are also lakes behind the forest, so you never know really. And uh, mm-hmm. I mean, people have been out in the woods trying to locate those things, but they never found anything. Have they ever seen them at night, or is it always daylight sightings? Oh, there were lots of uh, or night uh, time sightings as well, but most of them were probably meteors or other stuff. Yeah. Um, not very interesting, really, but there were hundreds of daylight sightings. And uh, as I told you before, one Swedish fighter pilot tried to to uh, get in contact, really, with one of those uh, rockets, but he was outflown by it, and he saw it, and his navigator saw it. 
for a couple of minutes. Wow. But they lost it. Has anyone ever tried to take a picture of one? There's only one picture published, and uh, that picture, which was published in many newspapers around the world at the time, turned out to be a daylight meteor, which is very, very scarce as well. It's, uh, it's not a very common uh, phenomenon. Mm -hmm. uh, and they happened to take a picture at the time that this meteor entered the Earth's atmosphere. Wow. So they got it. So that's nice, but it was not the ghost rocket. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How about that? Now, what about radar return, radar data? Is there any radar data on these? Yeah, there are. They, they, have, they had some very crude radar at that time. There was not very good radar equipment here in Sweden. The British had a, a, a full team waiting for T through. It was called Task Force One One Nine Six. They were waiting to come to Sweden to help out with good radar equipment but the Swedish Prime Minister decided eventually to say no to it and uh, we, we read a report a formerly secret report from, from uh, the British, they were very very angry with the Prime Minister they called him, called him cowardly and stupid because they really wanted to come here to do that so there are some reports, some radar returns but they are, they are not conclusive really but they, you can read about them in the military reports Wow. Uh, yes. Uh, so are people still, you say people are still seeing these. When is the last really good sighting that you're aware of? It was a couple of years ago, say three or four years ago, there was an observation up in the very north. The last really good crash was in 1999 in uh, the middle of Sweden. Seven people, I met all of them, um, did see around one lake from three different positions this elongated cigar shaped craft coming down crashing into the lake and the military came there and they worked for weeks wow it was a secret operation it was called operation sea find but they never found anything uh. in the sea uh, <laughs> we were on top of this because uh, it was classified but we got uh, the names of the witnesses through the local police which the military had forgotten to tell it was secret. Huh. So uh, <laughs> we forgot it that way. <laughs> wow, that's great. And I know that when I had you on before, um, you were saying that Sweden does not ridicule um, the UFO factor, which I think is wonderful. Can you talk about that? Yeah, it's very nice to, to be able to say that uh, because I've been to in, into this business since uh, 1974 and in the 70s. It was not as easy as it is now. Well, I think we were very much ridiculed at that time. But during the 1980s, the start, we started to turn this around. And when I went uh, to be chairman in, in 1990, I, I uh, was very, very keen on turning you for Sweden into a scientifically oriented organization. And uh, after that, uh, I can count on the times we have been ridiculed on my one hand. You know, it's... Uh, it never happens because we don't speculate. We tell people and journalists what we do, how we do it, and what our our results are. That's wonderful. We we have here uh, an it's an unknown, and they understand that we are we are dealing with an unknown, and we have not all the answers. That I think that's the, the key to all of this. If you have the answers, you're more like a, a cult or something like that. I mean, you should be very open-minded. I mean, as you are. I mean, you, uh, listening to you from the beginning here, I mean, you are really looking into UFOs the right way as UFOs, trying to find a solution. Yeah. Well, I think, um, you know, I think what the skeptics um, or debunkers, I should say either one, really jump on is when people go right to the ET explanation right off the bat without um, or claiming anything. Once you claim anything when it's unidentified, um, you know, you're you're going to get yourself <laughs> ridiculed, yeah. I think. So, you make yourself so. a very big disservice by doing that. And uh, I mean, I work quite closely with uh, the skeptics here in Sweden. I even give lectures for them, and I'm also asked by them to give lectures on on their behalf. I mean, we are not doing the same thing at all, really. But we are doing this, the thing with with a scientific instrument that we can. We must work with a scientific instrument, and we must work as scientists as much as we can. 
And that is also key to, to being uh, treated the way we are. Mm -hmm. Now, when you say using science or instruments, what type of um, what type of instruments are you talking about? We are talking about when it comes to the ghost rockets. I mean, like going up to Namayaro with sonars and uh, radar, ground penetrating radar, mm -hmm. things like that. Oh, I see. Uh, that mm -hmm. we, that we do, but we also do uh, statistics. Uh, and uh, look at um, the reports we, we, we are dealing with. I mean, we got 350, 400 plus reports every year to you for Sweden. Mm -hmm. And we are trying to get statistics of them. Uh, we did a very interesting thing in 2002, 4, 7, and 15. We went out around Sweden interviewing around 1,500 people, knocking wow. their doors, asking them, have you experienced anything unusual? in the sky? Have you been watching something you didn't, didn't understand at the time? And it turned out that one in ten had. The ten percent of the Swedish populations have done that. And nearly not any one of those one in ten had reported this to us, uh -huh. to the authorities, or to anyone. But there are a vast amount of observations out there in the US, in every country, never report it because people don't know where to report it or they don't want to report it. Absolutely, and I can talk my own sighting. I didn't report because I had, I never even thought to look online. This was in 2006. Never even thought to even look online for anything. So I called the local police station and was mm -hmm. uh, basically dealing with a sarcastic dispatcher and kind of gave up. And I never even thought about reporting it. I, from what I been told someone told me I could still report it <laughs> so I guess I still could uh, although you know at this point I wouldn't even remember the date or anything I could probably figure that out but uh, um, so along those lines someone wanted me to ask you this um, I know we're getting away from the ghost rockets I don't know if there's anything else you can add to the ghost rockets but uh, like I said that's always been one of my favorite topics um, so before I move on, is there anything else about the ghost rockets you'd like to uh, close that subject with? Yeah, maybe one thing. You asked me about pictures before, yeah. and there really are another a film. The film was taken in 1946. Really? That sounds really exciting, doesn't it? It does. <laughs> <laughs> because there was a man who was head of a, a company, a photographic company in Sweden, in Gothenburg. He had a very, very last uh, film camera with him. It was a brand new color film camera. They were traveling to Stockholm. He was traveling with friends, and they stopped south of Norrköp, north of Norrköp in, in Sweden. And when they were there, he mounted this camera on a tripod and started to film the scenery. Suddenly, one of his friends pointed up in the sky and said, look there, what's that? And he turned the camera towards this object. It was a cigar-shaped object mm. flying out of a cloud and into another cloud and out of that cloud. And he followed it all the way until it disappeared. And I interviewed this guy uh, many years later. He went to Stockholm. He called the military. And they were, of course, very interested. So they developed uh, He was invited together with his friends. They were interviewed, of course. To sit in this uh, uh, this uh, room with uh, eight or ten or maybe twenty officers, and the film was shown to them. It was blank, it was nothing, oh. because he had changed the the uh, the, the tele to telephoto lens lens, and he forgot to to adjust for the light. So it was all overexposed. Oh they my could see God! Nothing. Oh, that is horrible. Jeez. He had been thinking of this. Every day of his life, he told me. Every day of his life after 1946, he had been <laughs> thinking about it. Uh, you know, <laughs> a lot of times, uh, you know, the topic will come up while there's everyone has a iPhone camera on them or, you know, cell phone camera. Why aren't there more really good videos of UFOs? And, and I got to tell you, when I, when I had my sighting as brief as it was, um, I never even would have thought of a camera or anything. I was just like in the moment trying to figure out what the heck was going on. And I don't know, uh, I don't know, uh, 
you know, I've talked to Ray Stanford. He's he always has a camera ready. He always has for you know since his nineteen sixties. Um, yeah. But I just I I of course now I I think I'd be more apt to do that. But uh, you know when I first had that sighting, the camera wasn't even something I thought of. Um, in the forum, someone said uh, they wanted to know if you would talk about the UFO sighting that you and your wife had back in nineteen ninety five. Yeah, yeah, November the 5th. Yeah, I mean, uh, I've seen a couple of things, but this is really the most strange thing I ever saw. And uh, I'm not out looking for UFOs, <laughs> but I've been out hundreds and hundreds of hours looking at the stars with my telescope or binoculars or with my naked eye. But this time, at this uh, occasion in November, we were traveling from the north of, of Stockholm to our house, here in, in the outside, outskirts of Stockholm. And coming into uh, this area I live, it was one o'clock in the night. I saw a couple of persons standing, uh, waiting for the last bus. And one of them were pointing up in the sky like this. Mm. And the other one was looking. So I asked my wife if she could take a look, if she could see anything. So she leaned forward and took a look out the window of the car, but she said, it's just stars. It's a wonderful night. I can see lots of stars, but nothing else. So we continue, and we had passed the guys at that time, and uh, parked our car, maybe two minutes later. And we went out of the car, and, and uh, we stood by our house, and looked around at the sky, trying to figure out what they were really looking at. I think we, we stood there for a minute, maybe. And then, suddenly, just out of the darkness, quite... 40 degrees up in the sky three illuminated cross, crosses like this came flying huh. beside each other flying over us and we saw them, both of us, and they flew over us and they vanished behind our neighbor's house and I, I ran around the corner and I saw them flying uh, for maybe 10 seconds more and after that, of course, at that time I was uh, head of for Sweden we went inside and we didn't talk about this. I gave her a form, and I, I took a form myself. We sat in two, dif uh, two, two different rooms, and we filled out this form. We made the drawings, we answered all the questions, and after that, we compared. And I put an investigator to try to find the answer, but we never, never did. Wow. Now, I want you to talk about what you did was very important um, in a couple of different ways. First of all, you didn't have a conversation with the same person that witnessed it, and you did something immediately. Those two things are uh, very important, I think, when it comes to a sighting. Wouldn't you yeah. agree about that? Absolutely, absolutely. And look at the, we looked at the watch, of course, and took the exact time. Uh, so we oh, were, yes, we were the able time. to. Right, yeah. But that, that is the most important thing. And what is very much interesting, and that gives us a, a, some sort of feeling about the UFO mystery, I think. I didn't say anything about this for, for maybe a year or two, not even to my closest UFO friends. This was too strange. It was so strange. <laughs> but then I did. I talked about it. And in, in the radio interview I gave a couple of years after that, I told about the experience. And a, a listener called in and said, my mother saw something like this in 1930s. So I called her. And she had seen some very, very strange stuff because she was just a little girl at that time, maybe uh, 14 or 15 years of age. She was waiting for her mother outside the house, and it was the middle of the day, and suddenly she saw on the road, 100 meters from her, three crosses came out of nowhere, on the road oh. for five seconds, then vanishing into thin air. It just was there. They were there for just a couple of seconds, and then went away. Three crosses, but not the, up in the sky, but down, down on the road. That is really amazing. So, had you heard of, besides that other one sighting, have you ever heard of anyone talking about crosses other than that? No, well, it's very, 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 very scarce. I'm, uh, I'm not aware of anyone seeing at least three crosses like this. If you look back in the 13, 14, 1500s, you can read about crosses in the sky quite often, but most of the time they have seen something to do with the sun, some halo phenomena or something like that. Yeah. The crosses in the sky was really something 
that uh, uh, people who had very, very uh, deep beliefs could see. Mm. Nowadays, nobody sees crosses. Yeah. So, I, I personally yeah. think, that, um, I've said this before in this show, that sometimes I think the weirdest sightings are are some of the the best sightings because they're so unusual. It's almost like it can't be made up, <laughs> you know. That's right. Yeah. I mean, you, I absolutely agree with you. I mean, why tell a story that is so bizarre that not even your wife or children will believe you? I mean, why? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I've heard some, being on the show, I've heard some weird ones. And a, f- a friend of mine um, told the story a number of times on the Antiques Road Show, um, which is a popular show here. I mean, in the United States, not here in Russia. But <laughs> And uh, <laughs> he actually saw this box thing. Uh, it was a box-shaped thing. And then he saw it explode into five lights. And then the lights did like a formation. And a... Um, uh, uh, a fighter jet came after it and hmm. it disappeared but I mean you, you just hear these weird weird sightings I love them I actually love them um, yeah those high strangeness cases are not often mentioned uh, when you're writing UFO books or if you're giving speeches um, you're trying to make your, your speech or your book as comprehensive and, and as uh, um, as you are really understanding the the, the phenomenon but I could say after more than 40 years in, in, in this business that I do not understand it because it's so diverse. Mm-hmm. Uh, I wrote a book a couple of years ago about uh, one, 100 years of UFO sightings over Sweden, which I have investigated in, in some respects, all of them. And uh, you can find observations that there, there are not handily fit, fitting in into, into the usual ET concept at all. They're just strange, but they are as real as anything you can read in another book. Now, what uh, are you familiar with the uh, very unusual um, sighting where this guy was on his horse cart and this thing came down in a field? And did you ever hear that one? It was. Do you know which one I'm talking about? And he went up and then there were birds inside of it and all that. Did you ever hear this story? This is some. It was this a is very, not a new. It's a. It was it's a, an old one. Uh, I think it was in the 70s. I believe it was in the 70s. Um, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Now I, I do uh, understand what you're talking about. Wasn't it something in Poland? Or? Oh, okay. Yes, it was Poland. Okay. I was thinking it was uh, the Netherlands. Okay. So, yeah, but that is that was another real fascinating, very bizarre case. That, it, uh, is, it is. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm a member of the, the Magonia Network. Uh, it's a network of uh, quite a few, uh, you call them level headed ufologists, if you want. Uh-huh. But they are combing the, the uh, old newspapers, old magazines, old books from the 1600s and, and up till 1946, 47. Uh-huh. There you can find fantastic uh, observations. I mean, you can find things that uh, defy explanations today. Uh, they are not talking about aliens, of course. They are not seeing uh, the, the the popular ET shaped uh, alien. They are seeing other things, but they are experiencing UFO sightings in in their context where they are li- when they were living. Uh, they didn't understand it, of course. As we don't understand what's happening around us today. So it's been with us for many, many hundreds of years. This this fantastic uh, phenomenon. Yeah, and. Um I personally believe they could be they could have been coming here for millions of years. It's just the way uh civilizations line up could be, you know, totally different on another you know, in another galaxy or you know, another solar system. Um if they actually are I mean <laughs> there's still I'm not saying for sure they are coming here because I have absolutely no idea. So um w- what it's all about. It's uh and I, I had a conversation with uh, Jacques Vallée um, when we were both checking into the hotel out in Phoenix uh, a couple of years ago. And I said, I think I've said on the show that I do that uh, maybe it's something we haven't even thought of yet. And he kind of mm-hmm. laughed and he says, yeah, you're, you're, get, you're getting it, the idea of it or something like that. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah. and you doing this for so long, 
Uh, is that how you feel? You do you feel like you know perhaps it's something where we haven't even had the idea of how to explore yet, or do you think it? Yeah, it, it, I think it, I don't. I don't think uh, we have all the answers now because we don't have the tools to to to, uh, to find them really. And I think we do not really understand uh, the human psyche enough uh, because much of this is connected to human beings in a way that we we can see. When we are investigating UFO cases in Sweden, it's very important to follow the witnesses for many years. You can learn how they tick and what they believe, because not everything happens out there. Very much of it happens in here as well. Mm -hmm. It's a very complex matter. This you don't know really what that is happening in here can be something that is put in here from outside, of course, from someone else, something else some unknown, unusual, natural phenomenon, or something completely different. So yes, we are only scratching the surface. And to say that we have answers now is really to, to, to stretch it too far, I think. We have some answers, but the answers we have are the solutions of the misidentifications we are finding all the time. Mm -hmm. Now, you had mentioned that another thing that is or could be related is the high strangeness the paranormal? Uh, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, I, th I think that's that's what makes me tick really when it comes to UFOs is the the strange cases that are a little beside the ordinary cases. If I could, if, there, if there are any ordinary cases yeah. when it comes to yeah. UFOs, uh, I mean, I, I interviewed a guy who was 11 years of age in 1947 in September 1947. He was uh, walking back home to his uh, parents when suddenly he saw some multicolored rings kind of something this thick in the ground. I mean, it was impossible because the bubble would break if you do this, but he did it anyway. And there come, came another two of those guys with, in the same bubbles after him doing the same. Jeez. Unreal. And they, were, they were talking to each other. They were communicating, but he couldn't hear because sound seemed to be encapsulated inside the bubble <clears throat> and uh, they disappeared after a minute or so they were they were gone behind a barn a couple of hundred meters away and he went inside and uh, first he didn't tell anyone about it but eventually he did and nobody believed him of course and now I mean a couple of years ago he went, he went to us to tell this story he was a very very good person very credible man uh, who told a very strange story that we really cannot understand. What is this? Has this to do with UFOs at all? Yes, it was flying at least a decimeter over the ground, mm -hmm. but uh, it's not really what you what you talk about when you are dealing with with uh, with UFOs. I mean, there are lots of things like this. I mean, I talked to another guy who, in the late 1940s, his mother were out in broad daylight in in the garden. When a cigar shaped object, like a ghost rocket, but more like an Adamski mothership, really, <laughs> came flying. It was quite small, but it had portholes on its side. Mm -hmm. And it passed him and came, uh, passed her, sorry, and came back. And then she could see into the portholes. There were very ugly, strange, fearful, awful faces looking out at her. Wow. And it just blew away. Jeez. <laughs> Wow. So, yeah, I, I want to talk a little bit about the that because uh, the cigar-shaped things seem to have portholes, or there's been many accounts of that. But going back to the bubbles, the people floating down in bubbles, those had to be time travelers, don't you think? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, I've told this story a uh, number of times on this show, and I apologize to the to the uh, uh, avid listener of my show, but uh, my friend's father here in Russia, um, and I found out it was only about 10 years ago, had a, a cigar-shaped thing go through a mountain pass when he was going through this mountain pass. Uh, all the cars stalled uh, while this thing was going through. They got out of the car, uh, li one lifted the hood and stuff like that, trying to figure out what's wrong with the cars, and this thing floated through with portholes. 
And, um, you know, they could see all the, the, the thing. He was telling me the story in Russian and it was being translated to me. And it was just like he was telling a story of everyday life. He's not a person that's into UFOs or anything. And then he said all of a sudden everyone's cars, you know, they could start and run and they all drove away. No one talked to anyone. No one talked to each other. But that's, I'm finding out in Russia, that's generally what happens. No one talks to each other. <laughs> <laughs> So, oh, yeah, I went to Russia in 1993, and I met with lots of ufologists and brought back a huge archive from Moscow at that time. Wow. And uh, it was uh, very, very interesting to um, to see how the Russians were dealing with uh, UFOs at that time. 1993 was a very big interest. Um, they published lots of um, UFO magazines. Today, it's not that at all. There are no really glossy magazines about UFOs anymore. Uh, and there are no really good UFO organizations either. Something's happened there. They are more interested in the paranormal now, I think, than than, uh, than UFOs. Really? Wow. Yes, I've tried to find someone local here because there have been some sightings in this city. I found it online, but um, I can't find anyone that speaks um, good enough English to uh, mm. to be on the show. Uh, that's unfortunate. And uh, I've yeah. tried to work with people outside, you know, um, uh, Phil Mantle and a few other people trying to figure out if they could find someone here, um, but that hasn't happened. So, uh, but just to let the listener know, next week uh, Peter Robbins, he's from the U.S. He's going to be on, but we're going to be talking about Russian uh, UFOs. Uh, that that comes up next week. Um, so, yeah, they, 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 uh, remember to keep your eyes to the sky. <laughs>